Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to the first of two lectures that we're going to have about limits. So in this first lecture, we're going to go over the basics of what a limit is and we'll see some neat examples of how limits come up in practice. And then in the next lecture, we're going to talk about how to actually compute them, how to muck around and do math with them. Okay, so what is a limit? Well, a limit, it answers the question of if you have a function, what happens to that function near a particular input value? Not at a particular input value, okay? Everything that you've up, done up until now with functions has been, hey, I plug a number into a function and I find out what happens at that particular input, okay? Now we're switching focus a little bit and saying, okay, well, what happens near a particular input value, not at that particular point? We don't care what happens at that input value, only nearby, okay? So to sort of, uh, I don't know, draw a bit of a picture here to sort of illustrate what, what I mean by this, um, let's draw a graph of a function and let's say I want to know what happens near x equals 4, okay? I don't care what happens at x equals 4, just nearby. And maybe the graph of the function looks something like this. And as x gets closer and closer to 4, I don't know, maybe my y value is going up towards 3. Okay, and maybe something similar happens from the right. Maybe the graph from the right looks like this, and as x gets closer and closer and closer to 4, maybe the graph looks something like that. Okay, so in a situation like that, we would say that the limit as x approaches 4 is 3. Okay, we don't happen what we don't care what happens right at 4. Okay, maybe the function itself is actually, you know, way up here. Or maybe the function itself is way down here. Maybe the function jumps, okay? Or maybe it just fills in that gap perfectly and sort of extends the, the graph of the function how you would expect it to. That's fine too, okay? But we don't care. As far as the limit is concerned, we just care what's happening nearby, okay? What happens as x gets close to 4. Okay, so just to give ourselves a bit of notation and pin down what we mean a little bit more, um, suppose that the x value, the input variable, it's approaching some particular fixed number. We're just going to call that input number that we're approaching a. Okay, so in the previous slide, that was 4. a was 4. That was the x value that we were approaching. Okay, well, if the y value is approaching l, in other words, if the output or f of x is approaching l, that's the number on the y-axis, then what we do is we write down, this is the notation here, over here on the right, We've got limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l, okay? What that means as, is as x is getting closer to a, f of x is getting closer and closer to l, okay? So as x is going to a, the y value is going towards l. All right, so again, to draw a bit of a picture here, maybe a bit of a nicer picture than we had on the previous slide, if we have a function like this, then what's happening here is, well, as your x value approaches 4 from the left and as your x value approaches 4 from the right, notice what's happening to the y value. Imagine walking along the graph of this function. What's happening to your y value as you walk towards x equals 4? Well, my y value is getting closer and closer to y equals 3. Okay, so in that situation, we say that the limit as x goes to 4 of f of x equals 3. Okay, here's what the x value is approaching and here's what the y value is approaching. And again, we do not care what's happening at that particular uh, x value. We don't care, you know, whether this hole is actually filled in by that function or if it jumps up top or if it jumps down below. We don't care. Okay, we only care what's happening nearby x equals 4. Okay, so now we're going to go through two examples of the type of problem that limits can help us solve. And the first one of them is very mathematically motivated, okay? So let's suppose that we're dealing with this function here, f of x equals sine x over x, okay? And we'd like to understand basically what this function is doing. We'd like to understand how it's behaving, what its graph is doing, something like that. Okay, so the first thing to note about this function is it's not defined at zero, right? You cannot plug in x equals zero here because then you'll have, you'll have a zero on the denominator here. You'll have a division by zero. In fact, you'll have zero divided by zero because sine of zero is also zero. So you'll have zero on top and bottom and things get weird. Like it's not actually defined at zero, okay? But we can ask the question, what happens to this function near zero, okay? What happens to this function as x approaches zero? And that's what we mean here. Limit as x approaches zero of f of x. What's happening to the y value? What's happening to the output of this function as the x value gets close to zero, but is not at zero itself? Okay, so we don't have any actual tools for dealing with limits yet. So the first thing that we're going to try is, well, let's just plug numbers into that function and see what happens as they get closer and closer to zero. Okay, so if I plug x equals 1 into this function, I get some ugly decimal number. I get 0 0.84147, yada, 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 yada. And actually, maybe I should clarify this before we go any further. This function here and throughout this entire course, unless we say otherwise, 
whenever we have a trig function, we're talking in radians, okay? So uh, when I plug one into this function, I mean plug in one radian, okay? Not one degree, one radian. Okay, so if I plug in one, then I get some ugly decimal number. If I plug in 0 0.1, right, I'm going to choose numbers that get closer and closer to zero here. I'm choosing input numbers that get closer and closer to zero. So if I plug in 0 0.1, then what do I get out? Again, this is just a calculation. Plug it into your calculator or Wolfram Alpha or whatever you like. Then you're going to get this as your output number, 0 0.99833, yada, 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 some, some long, ugly decimal. Okay, maybe there's not a pattern yet. Let, let's go one step farther. Let's plug in 0 0.01 as our x value into this function and see what we get. And this time we're going to get an output value of 0 0.99998, yada, 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 some junk again. Okay, and maybe now we have a bit of an idea of what's happening to that y value, to the output value. As I plug in numbers that are closer and closer to zero, I seem to be getting output values that are closer and closer to one, right? So it seems like, hey, maybe this limit equals one. Okay, one thing that we have to be a little bit careful of is that we also check x values that are going towards zero from the other side, from the left or from the negative side. All right, so let's just do a little bit of a sanity check here. If we plug in x equals minus 0 0.01, well, it turns out we get the exact same y value, the exact same output value as on the previous line. Okay, and it turns out that the reason that happens is this function is even, okay? If you plug in, the ne if you plug in negative x everywhere in this formula, you get the same thing as if you just plug in positive x. Okay, so nothing weird happens if you approach from the left, you get the same things as if you approach from the right. Okay, so our guess is that the limit as x goes to zero of this function equals one. Okay, we haven't proved that, but I mean, numerics seem to be suggesting it. And we can see a little bit better why this is, is if we look at the graph of this function. Okay, if you look at the graph of this function, that's what I've plotted here. This is the graph of, uh, you know, y equals sine x over x. Um, and you can see, you know, as you walk along the graph here from the right or from the left, as x is getting closer to zero, your y value is going up to this y value here, which is exactly y equals one. That's the height there where that hole in the graph is. Okay, so really, yeah, this limit does equal one. Okay, that's, you know, it's a known fact. We haven't quite justified that here, but hopefully it should seem believable. Okay, as another example, one that's maybe a little bit more real world, let's talk about compound interest. Okay, so as a very, very toy example of compound interest, suppose that you have $1 and you want to make it rich. Okay, so you invest that $1 in the stock market or, you know, mutual funds or whatever. I don't recommend doing that now in the middle of the pandemic, but you know, whatever. Suppose that you want to make it rich and you are very, very lucky and you find, you find some sort of fund or something that has a 100% yearly interest rate. This is very unrealistic, but just for the sake of simple numbers, let's imagine, you know, 100% yearly interest rate. Okay, this yearly interest rate, it's called annual percentage rate, okay, or APR. We're going to call it APR for short throughout the rest of this video, and that's what they call it in the real world. All right, now, here's the question, okay? If I invest $1 with 100% yearly interest rate, or APR, how much money will we have after one year? And, okay, cue Jeopardy music. No. Okay. You know the answer. Okay. The answer is you will have $2, right? I mean, that $1 is just going to double. It's going to become $2. All right. Easy peasy. Let's complicate things a little bit. So what if the interest is compounded? Okay. So what we mean by this is, for example, what if they don't give you all that 100% interest at the very end of the one year? Okay. What if they give you 50% of the interest after six months, and then they give you another 50% interest after another six months? Okay, then we have the same question. How much money are you gonna get after the year? And this time it's a little bit different because it works through the calculation in two steps, right? Okay, after six months, you're gonna get 50% interest. So after six months, $1 becomes $1.50. Okay, and then after another six months, you're gonna get 50% interest again. So this time what's gonna happen is, well, after the other six months, at the very end of the year, you're gonna get 50% interest on what you currently have, which is a buck 50. 50% interest is 75 cents, so you're gonna, you're gonna end up with $2.25 at the end of the day, okay, at the end of the year, okay? And that's because, like, the reason that you're getting more money here is because the interest accrues on interest that you've earned previously, right? What happened here is, well, you, you earned 50 cents interest, and then you earned interest on that 50 cents, getting you another 25 cents, okay? And what happens here is we get something that's called annual percentage yield, or APY, instead of annual percentage rate, or APR, okay? The APY, that's how much interest you get after a year 
when you take compounding into account, when you take into the fact that banks, they, they give you interest not just right at the end of the year, but maybe twice a year or four times a year or very commonly once a month, 12 times a year. Okay, so the APY, that's how much interest you actually get over the course of the year when you take compounding or interest on interest into account. Okay, so, I mean, compounding more frequently gives you more money because, well, you get more interest on interest. The more you break it up, the earlier you get interest, the earlier you can get interest on that interest, and so on. The quicker it can start to build up on itself. So let's do a little table here where we carry on with this example where we're investing $1.00. We have an APR of 100%. In other words, we get a total of, you know, like the, the base interest rate is 100% per year. And now let's break it up and see how much money we end up with and what kind of APY we get after we compound different numbers of times. So we've already done if we compound just once. In other words, if we don't compound, we only get interest once at the end of the year. Well, we just double our money. We get 100% APY. And we've already done the calculation where if we compound twice, you know, if we get interest twice, then we ended up with $2.25, which is 125% APY, right? Our money increased by 125% over the course of the year. Well, if you do the same calculation, but compound three times, in other words, you know, you get interest after four months, and then you get another third of the interest after another four months, and then you get a final third of your interest after another four months at the end of the 12 months, then this is the calculation. Well, it's just one plus one third raised to the power of three, which works out to approximately $2.37, which is 137 cents or 137 percent APY. Okay, our money increased by 137 percent over the course of the year. Okay, if you do it four times, right, if you break it up into three months chunks now, every time giving you a quarter of your interest, you end up with about two dollars and 44 cents. Okay, let's jump a little bit now. What if you do it monthly, which really is you know most common with banks? If you do it monthly, so it's broken up into 12 chunks, well, now you're going to end up with rough, roughly two dollars and 61 cents at the end of the year. And if we jump again to maybe in the next most common realistic scenario, if you jump to, you know, compounding 365 times a year, okay, so it compounds after every day, interest is calculated after every day, and you get 100, uh, one, you get one 365th of your interest after every day, well, then it's going to compound very quickly, and you're going to end up with a rough, with roughly $2.71 at the end of the year. Okay, so compounding more frequently gets you more money, okay? In general, if you compound n times, this is the formula that you use in this simple scenario where it's just $1 going in and 100% APR. This is the formula that you use that tells you how much money you're gonna have, have after one year, right? Because it's just, well, you're getting one nth of the interest at every time, but then you're doing it n times. Okay, so here's the question. What happens as n goes towards infinity? In other words, what happens as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? There are a couple things that could happen. One thing that could happen is, hey, Maybe I just get more money and more money and more money and more money. Maybe if I compound it like 70 million times, I get like a billion dollars. Okay, maybe the amount of money that you get grows without bound. Maybe, I don't know. Or maybe, maybe there's some sort of finite upper limit where like, yeah, you keep on getting more and more and more money the more times you compound, but never going across a certain threshold. So which of those cases happens? And if there is a threshold, what is the threshold? Well, it turns out that this upper limit, this threshold does exist, okay? It turns out that you're never going to make more than roughly $2.71.828 yada 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 cents, okay? This number E that we saw in a previous lecture, okay? So what we do is we say that this limit as n goes to infinity of that expression that we saw earlier on the previous slide, the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n all raised to the power n, that equals E, okay? And all that means is that as N gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, this expression here gets closer and closer and closer and closer to that number, okay? So, and yeah, so as N gets bigger, we make closer and closer to $2.71.828 yada 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 cents, okay? So if we bring back this table that we saw on a previous slide, we can add one more row now, sort of an infinitieth row, okay? This doesn't actually mean that we're like plugging infinity into that function. It just means that as n gets closer and closer to infinity, the amount of money that we get after one year gets closer to this number, and our APY gets closer and closer to that number, okay? More generally, okay, so if we break free of this realm where we're just investing $1 and we have an APR of 100%, which is very unrealistic, more generally, if we have some particular APR, then the way that we compute the APY that we're going to have, okay, so if we have sort of a base interest rate, 
which is our APR. And we want to know, well, how much money, how much, what is our interest rate actually after we take compounding into account? Then this is the formula that we use, okay? And this is very similar to what we had before, right? It's just this APR over N part, that's just, you're taking your base interest rate and you're splitting it up N times. You're only giving you one nth of it at a time, but then you're doing that N times. So you have an exponent of N at the end of the day. Okay, so if you have a base APR, that's how you compute the APY out of it if you compound it a particular number of times, if you compound it n times, okay? But if the APR is compounded continuously, and what, what that means is, you know, sort of infinitely many times, if you sort of infinitely subdivide it, okay? In other words, if you take a limit as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then the resulting APY, it's just, well, it's the limit as n goes to infinity of this expression up here. We just take the limit as n goes to infinity of that expression. And what we end up with, well, it's very similar to before. Remember, we had this e in that limit before. Well, now it's just e to the power of whatever your APR is. So in our previous example, the APR was one, right? It was 100% was our base interest rate. And then our APY ended up being this number e minus one. Minus one could sort of subtract off the one that you start with, okay? All right. It's important to be aware of this distinction between APR and APY. Because APY takes compounding into account, it's always going to be bigger than APR. And banks, for example, take advantage of this, okay? When you, when you see an interest rate for a savings account or when you see an interest rate, rate for a credit card or a loan, sometimes they report APY and sometimes they report APR, okay? And the reason they do that is because, again, APY is bigger than APR, so sometimes it's to their benefit to... Uh, announce or advertise a bigger interest rate, the APY. For example, if they're advertising a savings account, they wanna say, hey, our interest is really high on these savings accounts. But if they're advertising a loan or a credit card, they're gonna advertise APR, right? Because that's a smaller number, it doesn't look as bad because you're the one paying the interest there, okay? So for example, this is a screenshot from a bank's website. They're advertising savings accounts that they have, okay? And you can see that, yeah, the, the numbers that they're advertising here, they're APY, okay? And these are absolutely atrocious interest rates too, by the way, but I mean, pandemic and all that. But these numbers, they are APY. They're advertising, you know, the actual yearly interest rate that you get after they do their compounding. And at this particular bank, they do do compounding monthly. So they compound the interest 12 times. And after they do that compounding, these are the interest rates that you get. Okay, but if you go elsewhere on that exact same bank's website and instead want to say apply for a credit card, okay, well now all of a sudden they're advertising APR. You see that right down here. On the credit card, they advertise APR instead of APY. And why is that? Well, now because like you're the one that pays interest on credit card. For a, a savings account, they pay the interest and they want to make it sound like they're, they're paying you lots. But now you're the one paying the interest on the credit card, so they want to make it sound like you don't have to pay that much. Okay, so they advertise the APR instead because it's a lower number. In particular, this credit card, it has an APR between roughly 14% or 24%. If you do the calculation using the formulas, formulas that we saw earlier, you see that this APR of 13.99%, well, that's an APY of a little bit bigger, of 14.92%. And similarly, this APR of 24%, you know, it has a correspondingly little bit bigger uh, APY. Okay, so that'll do it for this lecture. Next time, we're gonna talk about how to actually compute limits.